Welcome. I'm David Levi Strauss, chair of the MFA program in art writing here at the School of Visual Arts. And this is Quixote Talks, a series of pointed discussions about relative, relevant pasts and possible futures. I, I met Fong Bui in 2003. Is that right? Yeah. 14 That's years ago, when Joan Waltemath did the first Brooklyn Rail interview uh, with me, and we did the interview in Fong's living space. Uh, and he sat in on the interview, and we immediately struck up a friendship. And I published a lot of things in the rail over the next 15 years, and I l met a lot of the extended rail community. Um, and Fong was very generous with that community. I introduced Fong to Leon Gallup and Nancy Sparrow, Carly Schneemann, Mick Tausig, Peter Lamborn Wilson, Leo Steinberg, John Berger, and others. And he introduced me to Jonas Mikas, Ron Gorchoff, Bill Jensen, Dorothea Rockburn, Robert Bergman, Chris Martin, and many others. So our affinities and sensoriums mingled for good. During this early period, Fong used to continually ask me for advice about what to do with the rail. And I responded with a lot of very carefully thought out and uh, detailed advice. Looking back now, I realize that Fong never ever took any of my advice about the rail. <laughs> uh, he did, however, take my advice on other subjects, including matters of the heart. And I like to think these had more lasting effects. And I took some of Fong's advice, including his urging for me to accept this job when it was offered to me, and I think that worked out okay for the last 10 years. Fong and I have gone through good times and bad. We've disagreed about many things, but also found ways to work together on the things we both believe in, of which there are many. Tonight he's gonna talk about the rail philosophy and project and its possible future. Please welcome Fong Bui. It's nice that I think having observed David throughout the years and how he got out his lavish library up in, if you're lucky you get invited to High Falls. Uh, some of you have been there He's managed to get out of that place and be here sharing his knowledge and his views of everything, really, the young art. I think the conscience of David have really have, um, in a way, broadened my own perspective and insight about things, about life in art. Um, so it's nice to be here to share some of that. In a way, the rail started out as a pamphlet. I mean, this is 1998, uh, when a group of friends would meet in the Brooklyn Ale House. It's only second bar in Williamsburg in those days, beside Teddy's. Um, so the, we used to argue a lot about things. Everyone was so obsessed about what he or she knew, uh, although they tend to stay in their own field, specific field of interest. You get them out of it, they are lost, and that really bothered me a great deal. And then at some point, um, I was reminded by a Vietnamese proverb. It goes, when you argue with an intelligent person, you can't win. But when you argue with a stupid person, you can't stop. <laughs> so that seemed to be sufficient. It was good enough to start something as a pamphlet. It was a, merely an 8 by 11 sheet of paper. We fold it in half. So there appear four columns. And uh, I was a pamphleteer. I would go out to the L train on Bedford Avenue every um, you know, Monday morning, and I would, it was a bi-weekly. I would hand out those. There was no more than 12 people going to work in those days, and I know at least eight of them. <laughs> so in the weekend, we would get together, and they would tell you what they read and what they think of it. The idea is all printed as a way to read all together by the time they get the other side of each river. And it's very appealing, it's very effective, and was super cheap to produce. And um, I think in 2000, yeah, October 2000, I think that summer I saw a painting 
um, for two thousand dollars, and I borrowed additional five hundred dollars, and I wanted to start a paper because I had read so many marvelous magazines and journals, um, having I don't know collect some of them, like seven arts, you know, partisan review in the old days, new mass and. Tiger's Eyes, I mean, could name hundreds of them. And there was a romance about having made uh, myself to be more romantic uh, as those people who I knew, those, some of the people who made, created it. You know, I remember um, interviewing George Brazila. Um, we also interviewed Bonnie Rose. So there was a lot of people who before myself and others have done it. Uh, and it was a romance, you know, listen to their story, how they made it, um, gone through the hardship. And I think it all ultimately had to do with the idea of journey. You know, I, I always try to tell my, my young colleagues, my production assistant particularly, um, it, it's a journey, it's not a trip. It's not where you know exactly where you leave and get and go somewhere. The journey you don't know. You just don't know, and that's a thrill of it. That's a romance. I remember as a kid asking my grandmother, who was a Buddhist, uh, why did Buddha, who's going to be the next king of Nepal, leave his family and children behind? And she said, it's a journey which is different than a trip. And that's the uncertainty that you have to sort of be romantic and understand what it entails. It's what's so interesting. You know, um, and I don't know. I all I know is that I wanted to do it as uh, cohesively as possible, as meaningful that I know how. So if you look at that piece right there that was made in October 2000, the same month that the railway started, and it was called Omar to Tatlin. I was doing a lot of construction work at the time. So I was so um, intrigued in the idea of constructionism and construction. So it was a pun <laughs> in my work. And I, I was a very good sheet rocker, a taper. So I know how to do this construction. So I made this piece. And that's how it was the same month that the rail got started. Um, and that's the first issue of the rail. It was only, I would say, 12 pages. All right, it's 14. There was two big ads in it, minus. The recent issue that just came out today is 128 pages. And I, <laughs> I've always been asked, uh, who reads the rail phone? What kind of demographic? What's the readership? Who reads the rail? And I always say, those that read. That's all there is to it. I mean, I'm not interested to speculate, analyze contemplate who actually read the rail. You know, you've done your job like an artist, you know? You create an object, like a writer, you write a book, and the rest just let it go. Just like a sh I love what Brack once say about uh, idea and actuality of things that take off. Idea is like building a cradle in order to build the ship. But when the ship is in the water, it's no longer need the cradle, you know? So it's like that. I think every month I feel that repetition, um, which makes me extremely happy. So this is the first uh, issue of the rail, and you can see the formation, the composition reflected. But you know the the composition, even the the um, typology of it, typography and everything. Uh, that's actually an image taken by a photographer named Anders Goldfarb. That was in 1998 in Williamsburg. So you can imagine how different it is today. You can't even walk on the sidewalk because it's all sardine pack, especially in the rush hour. It's super annoying. Um, that's another view from that piece. Uh, it was made in a week. And the idea is that you, I would make those installations, and it's equally thrilling to destroy them at the end of the show. So what remains is actually study for those things. And I, the study is very important to me. I have it, I have kept consistently in the same format. Uh, it's similar to how a musician um, would 
I, I guess, um, practice their scale before they do their performance, you know, and this is equivalent of this, I guess, practicing the scale. So I have a lot of these. I've done over a thousand of them, uh, but more than 800 were destroyed by Sandy. In fact, 90% of my work was destroyed by Sandy. Um, but it's good. I now have a re good reason to start from the very beginning. Another view of another piece. These are those that survive. Um, and around 2008, the idea of making the page pages with drawn portraits by hand became more ambitious, more urgent. Because when you make a drawing like, like this, I taught myself how to do this. Partly, I observed Chuck Close did his own, doing his own. So I created a method doing this. But what is so interesting doing the portrait is that you, you read the interview or who, whatever the essay, the, the, in, in this instance, is Bessie Baker. You guys probably know her. She was an uh, editor-in-chief of Art in America for 30 Six years, for a long time, and she was a guest critic around 2012. You notice that every month I would invite a critic, um, as Levi David here did one, I think, last December, and that you came out, Hakim, and was were you? What did you manage to come out, Annette? I think you. No, she was resting, installing for the show of her gallery that night. Uh, so the portrait is a very important part of the rail. Um, it's hand-drawn, and by the time I finish reading the interview or the essay, I feel I know the person well. I know why she or he think the way she or he thinks, you know? It's very intimate, and it looks much more in uh, warm than the actual photograph of the person. So it became part of my practice. Uh, in a while, I will talk. I will talk, tell you guys the, the other insane idea: why the rail has to be a work of art. It always been, but it's hard to articulate why it need to be a work of art. Um, I don't know. You tell me later whether it is or not. Uh, another portrait of John Elderfield. This probably was made during the time of his. Terrific show. It's called Radical Invention. Matisse between 2011 and 14. When Matisse being much older than Picasso, probably nine years older, uh, realized that he had to catch up with Cubism. So that was a period specifically focused on that uh, body of work of Matisse. So it was a pleasure to speak to John about that segment of Matisse's work. Um, Frank Leibowitz, fun to talk to. I think we probably smoke at least a pack and a half cigarette. Um, she loved to smoke. She would never quit, ever. Um, I never seen anyone's, I mean, her book collection is marvelous. They all first edition, and they all have glass cases. Um, very well protected, and I say, why, why did you do that for? Say that so the smoke doesn't get into them. <laughs> Typical rail uh, editorial meeting. Often um, it would include artists. Um, David mentioned Dorothea Rockburn. So on the right, you see her sitting right next to me on my left. And it's Joaquin Pizarro to the far end on the left. Um, and many other writers. Some of them have gone through the program here. At uh, Charlie Sutz, sitting on my right, on the right, uh, is now the managing editor of the rail. Very thrilled, excited, happy to have Charlie be in that position, because we're trying to co cultivate a much more cohesive and warm community. I, ca I don't have the patience for bureaucratic co-environment. Um, so this is the way that I feel the rail should always be. I fight very hard to keep it that way. Uh, you probably have heard the near the recent coup d'etat, but I survive it. So now I'm creating a new staff, a new board. Uh, you guys invited, by the way, this Saturday. We're going to have a, 
an editorial meeting at 6.30 for the art writers, and at 8 o'clock will be a party. You're all invited. Um, this is a very typical when we are invited or doing panel discussion outside of the rail context. This was on the occasion of Harvey Quitman, who had just died, uh, passed away that time. I think it must have been three years ago at David McKee. So I was asked to moderate a panel uh, with Dory Aston, with R.H. Quitman. Ron Gorchoff came and I got him in the front to be part of the panel. And I don't know where Eve Lambois is, but he may be on the right. Um, I think this is another panel we did at Hunter College uh, during the course of Laura Hoffman show about painting at MoMA. It's right, I mean, it was a very controversial show. You guys probably remember. Remember it was two years ago? Uh, this is, when was this? Two years ago, um, I was asked to curate a show for Paul Kassman. Paul Kassman uh, did not want to pay for the transportation of Will Ryman's Big Bird for my show, The Sandy Show. Um, so he feel bad about it, so he asked me to do this show. When I came to see the show, uh, it was a show that was dedicated to Alexander Yolas, who was a dancer, ballet dancer. Um, and then he, I think he broke his leg, so he became an art dealer. And he, create, he would became the director of this gallery called Ugo Gallery. It was, in fact, Victor Ugo's granddaughter. Um, it was a Amazing gallery. It lasted for about eight years. He was the director. Uh, in 1947, he invited Nicholas Callas, the surrealist poet and art critic, uh, together with Frederick Kiesler to curate a show there. It's called Blood Flame. And Kiesler, as you guys remember, who have created the art of the century before the Guggenheim Museum were created. And it, you probably seen images of the art century where the wall was concave, remember? Artwork, painting was projected on a wooden apparatus. No frame, so that way you can hold the painting and turn all different size. And painting sometimes even on, was installed on the ceiling. Very, uh, he hated cubism. So everything about the space has to be equally treated um, in a way, energized. And that was the show that I loved the idea. And I say to Paul, I will do the show uh, without being nostalgic. I will do the show, take over the two gallery. Uh, but two things that you must let me do um, is you should pay for the free catalog. There'll be funding money to commission poets and dancer, and the catalog has to be free, and it will cost you a while, a bit of money. And he was agree. So we did the show, <coughs> and it was, I took the, L, the, the uh, R train to meet Paul for lunch. And on the R train, the passenger seat had those colors, the bumblebee yellow and flame red. So that became the war. <laughs> And the platform. The platform raised above is completely reflecting right under the high line. And I felt like it's so nice to treat, as uh, Yolas once said, that the viewer became the dancer and the decor would be like a, a, a set by artists. As he say always, like it's a preparation of a, a ballet you know, uh, events. The Create show was similar like that for him. And for me, it was a way to homage, pay homage to your last. So I want to raise the wooden floor up like that so to give a different perspective so people can have two options. They can walk on it and they can also walk on the soft um, hay. The hay was so fresh when it was installed the opening night, and I, I suspected it would happen, 
people sneeze like crazy. So we, in fact, we, we record all the sneeze sound, sneezing sound. It's, it's part of the, we have it in the archive. We actually have all kind of a recording device under the platform too. It's super fun. So on the left, uh, you see, you see Dabro Cass and then Donna Murphy. In the middle uh, is Alex Katz and then Michael Zhu. Um, and then further down is probably Linda Banglers. And on the right is Tunga, who died last year. Marvelous uh, Brazilian artist. I got to know the last two years of his life. And then Chris Martin, right next to it. And then Johanna Pusitdot, Len Ligon in the middle. Uh, and I remember at the opening, someone asked me why, why include Glenn Ligon, the blue color, because everything else is, have a strong pitch to uh, the you know, chromatic of red. I say, actually, I learned that interviewing uh, John Elderfield about Matisse. Matisse use of blue is very predominant at that period and throughout his life, really. And he was asked, why do you use black? Also that period when he's trying to adopt cubism. And he said, I use the black in order to cool down the blue. Because if you look at the, the flame, the most, the hardest is the blue, it's not the red. So that was the idea behind using that painting. It was a, f a very fun show to do. I think we did it all in maybe eight days, eight days of installation. Uh, ben Keating on the top, hanging on the ceiling, you can see. I don't know, I have a lot of views. This is Tono Polizzi, uh, G.T. Polizzi, who was my student at um, Cooper Union, a friend one of the founders of Bruce High Quality Foundation, now just came to an end. You guys probably read it in Art News. So that's his piece, and that's the dancer. Um, David, you know who that is. Daniel Joseph Martinez, old friend of David and mine. Um, and that's a perfect piece for it. It's, uh, doesn't it look like a pastel painting to you guys? It's very beautiful, sublime, and it's it's have strong reference to um, the famous general, uh, police general chief, shooting Viet Cong by Nick Oak. But it's also a reference to Joseph Boyd. It's hard to see in the front, but actually there's a hair that shoot out the mouth, the blood, or the artificial blood. So that's the view of a dancer. I think she's rehearsing. Um, Here's another view. Another, another former program, uh, Sarah Kristoff, previously been the managing editor of the rail. And the guy on the right is the guy who's, who was kicked out here the program, Lauren Monk, James Calm. You know, the calm report, he's there filming it. You know, you don't invite him, but he does it anyway. Hello. Uh, that's Barry Swapsky um, giving a reading. I think we have, uh, we commissioned four poets for this project. And one of the poems was written for three people reading simultaneously. Um, if you go online, you can find it, actually. I think it's online in the Rail Kill Tour project. Another great project, I don't know. I mean, curation is super fun for me because I always uh, trust my intuition. It's always, it, it, there's a Vietnamese proverb. It goes, I'm trying to get over from the last night, two nights on the road going out, so my voice a little bit. Horse. As a Vietnamese proverb goes, to live in a long tube, be thin. To live in a barrel, be round. So that's my curatorial philosophy, in a way. So a more, it, it's more or less to do with how I respond to a specific space. It's not an intellectual idea in which I bring an impose on the space. It's always the space that I see and I respond, and that would be the show. It, the space tell me what to do. This is something 
that when early on David mentioned Dave, uh, Peter Limbo Wilson, uh, who also write under the pen name Hakim Bay, I think it must have been in early 90s, 92, when he wrote the book TAZ, T-A-Z. It means Temporary Autonomous Zone. How can you activate a space when it's still unstructured? It's like the time, the day, in fact, one of the most beautiful passages in David's wonderful book, Between Wolf and Dog. It's the time, the day, when the dog can become a wolf. The potentiality of becoming is great. It's unpredictable. And that's the kind of space I'm interested in. How can I operate, activate that space, come in and make something magical happen, and then get out yeah. before I become a bureaucrat? I can't do it. So this, this, um, <laughs> this space is Red Bull Studio, and it was intended to build as a high functional musical recording studio. So it had curl walls, it had it's painted black, which is a disaster. So when I was invited to meet Max Wolf, the manager there, I look at it and I say, Max, you want me to do something? The only thing that makes this place, the show jazzy and alive, we, I had to turn it into, we had to turn it into an Austin Power film set. And it will cost you 250,000 bucks. <laughs> and that's it, that's what exactly we did. I called up Jim Lambie, and that's a Jim Lambie floor. It took 10 people to do it because you have to lay down one stripe at a time. And I think we have 10 people doing it for the whole seven days. It's super intense. And um, in fact, in the corner there, we'll, we'll get to a minute, but you can see uh, several artists was included for means of contrast. So if you see the big, robust, Head here, the monster of Ugo Rondinone, um, bulky, monstrous, heavy, and I immediately wanted to put Rona Pondic right next to it, the opposite. Ephemeral, light, polished, not as rough. Um, I'm always trying to play with contrast, as you can see far in behind Peter's soul the four raccoon painting, Jackson Pollock's painting, and on the right is Lisa Zuskevich. Uh, why? Because they're both surrealists. They're using surrealist automatism, but one is more neutral, using the flatness and abstraction. The other one is still operate on the illusionistic death, you know? Dream sequence, sort of Freudian-like sequence, and that's Lisa. So it's, again, it's similar to the contrast of uh, Rona Pondic and Ugo Ronginone. And here is a below floor. Um, the crack that you see on the far left there, you have to come in, I think you have to slide through almost like a zip of Newman painting in a way. And inside is, I believe it's, uh, it's Will Ryman. I'm sorry, guys, I don't think it's here. But it's, uh, it's a very big installation, and inside it has cover. The whole four, three, four walls were covered by uh, children between the age of 8 to 12. It's, it's a comment on child labor, but it's very hypnotic. You go in there, and, and it, the smell is pretty intense. And you see the shimmering of the glossy red coming through the white the white shoes. Um, it's, it's a remarkable installation. Um, and then right in front is um, Lisa Soskevich, and you can see the yellow is being carried right through the under the stair, just to bring down the first floor to the second floor. Uh, through that window to the right is Chris Martin, hunting for mushroom. And this is the front view of the second, of the below floor. And the opposite view is this area where, in order to mimic or correspond the Jim Lambie floor, 
I have it covered with pink shad. It was a great show because children love to grow on it. I never see so many mother and father uh, bringing their children to see the show. Uh, so there's a lot of different people here. Uh, Ruth Pearson, James Siena, uh, Sylvie Flore, Deborah Cass, and John Kessler. I don't think I have all of the images to, to show you, but here is a, another panel discussion about um, psychedelic culture. Um, Fred Tomaselli, I think it's Errol Morris' son, Hamilton Morris, was a moderator. Chris Martin's on it, Ken Johnson, who wrote the book, was on the panel. It was really, really fun. I think you can hear it online. I think it was taped, recorded. Uh, here's another show uh, that was very memorable. Uh, it was in 2013. It was a year after Sandy destruction. I was invited to hear a show from the Dadalus Foundation, which is Robert Motherwell Foundation. And they have taken out a satellite for their extra space for Motherwell's archive. It was initially 5,000 5, square feet. I came and I saw the space. It was very raw. It was the whole entire industry city complex was not touched for at least 38 or 40 years. Uh, so when I came, it was very raw, it's very romantic, you know, so they want me to do the show. And I'm jokingly told the management, if you have more raw space like this, why don't we do a bigger show, you know? So they call me back in two weeks and say, yes, we discovered more, more space. Uh, why don't you come and, and have a look? And it turned out to be 100,000 square feet. Big, big show. And this... this Space alone is 30,000 square feet. And we did it um, less than three months. We had to build the wall. We had to sand the floor. I think in a month and a half of that summer, uh, I visited 112 artist studios, sick a day, nonstop for five weeks. But you know the strange thing is the first few days, you exhaust it. But then, then you got used to it, and then the artists actually give you the energy. The visit became what Levi David was very brilliantly um, talk about in his great essay about Walter Hobbes and Zyman, Herat Zyman. These are people who know how to chill in the artist studio. That's the key. If you make the artist feel at home, Marvelous conversation can occur anytime. So uh, by the third week, I just got addicted to it, you know. I still make studio, two studio visits per week. I love it. I mean, if I don't do anything else, I, I think I can just do that all day long, you know. He loves it too. Um, so here's another view. Uh, we often, as I say, always have events going on. It's not enough to do this a show. It has to share the things that appear in the rail. So there's music, there's theater, there's poetry. So that's what we do. We always, I don't do any show unless there's a component uh, in, in which reflect the rail. You know, so this, we commissioned um, a performance by Blade Runner Trio. You know them at all? Nicholas Jar. Alfred Lujar's son, that's Nicky. I mean, we know him, what, when he was about this big. He's very popular now, evidently. Super handsome. Uh, so it was a fun, fun night. And uh, yeah, Red Bull provide a lot of stuff. You know, I don't know, it's, it's, uh, it's kosher to mention it. But um, uh, another view of the Sandy show, uh, the great thing about curating is that you discover new artists. So in the course of making studio visit, I discover Joe Nigogosian, who just have a beautiful show of tea. Um, three weeks ago it ended. And that's when she just got out of Yale, a uh, couple of years, I think. Uh, work changed a great deal, but put it right in front of the eerie green 
she painted by Alex Cat was perfect uh, contrast. Sandy in reference, you know, the wreckage, the destruction. It's implied very poetically, obviously. Ron Gorchoff, hello. Love Ron. One of the great, great painters who have not shown for the longest time until 2006. Maybe a good 20 years. He's very difficult. He hates, he have a profound distrust of dealers. He makes them feel super anxious. In fact, I witnessed where he actually kicked them out of his studio several times. Very awkward. Um, but he's a great painter. He, he's chill. He's, not <laughs> he's actually very nice now, um, becoming, I guess, more um, patient with people. But I always have great admiration for him. Um, when we interview Elizabeth Murray for her retrospective, when Rob Stewart and I did it together, um, we asked her about her influence. She said, there are no Ron Workshop, no Elizabeth Murray. So Ron was the first who really dealt with the um, tail end of the late 60s and the beginning of the 70s when painting was on the retreat. When and it makes sense. You guys remember the famous Brian O'Doherty's essay, Inside the White Cube? That was written in 72, I think. Two essays. Uh, but that's what happened. I think that Soho became the place where artists live. They are a very big space. So it's perfect for people, artists like to make things according to the space they worked in. You know, just like Morandi's 400 square feet uh, studio, he makes four paintings. You know, so if you, if Richard Serra's 3,000 square feet studio is going to make big sculpture, it makes sense. So everything was big, geometric, very, you know, imposing. Painting was on the street. And uh, sculpture was the thing at the time that people were doing. And Ron was the first who was able to figure it out a three-dimensional structure, you know, have convex and concavity together, uh, but still able to paint, treat the painting on top of it all. Um, I won't have time to go into the depth of iconology of Ron's work, but maybe later. Another view of commissioned dance. We, I think the Sandy Show we commissioned at least four dance performances, four musical performances, four poetry reading, a couple of screen, film screening, and endless um, interview with artists. And that, that's always so fun. Um, here's another view of poetry reading, right in front of uh, Chris Martin painting in the background. And if you see in the foreground is uh, maybe six, small sculpture by John Newman. And um, if you look close, you see the color kind of correspondent together between Chris's use of red, green, and yellow. Um, it's subtle, but it's definitely there. Another view of our editorial meeting with Marianne Cause. Um, it's always fun. It's not that different like this. But it's not so fun because I'm the one who talked the whole time. So I'm going to add it, end very soon so we can have a real, real discussion or conversation. Um, I don't know why this is, one is here, but this probably was made in um, 2006. So you can see the big leap between the early installation for Tatlin, where it's still, still pretty much on the wall. Now it's sort of spilled out on the floor and it, the form become more broad, more geometric really, more minimal. Um, it's a big installation. It's, uh, it's 2,000 square feet space. And I know it killed me. Uh, I don't know why these are here. These are my collage paintings. When I'm busy, I would do a little bit doodlings on different pieces of paper. Um, maybe 
I don't know, phone conversation, and I would doodle. And in the end of the, the weekend, when I had more time, I put them all together. It became a collage. It's still a practice of mine. Um, here's another one. Uh, this installation was very interesting because I didn't have time to do anything elaborate, but I just put together what I have in the studio. Um, this is the last one I did, um, which I include my friend's work along with my own. And that's always been the aspiration. I mean, how can I create a, a, a work of art, potentially, that have my friends in it? Can that be possible? Uh, this was a very important piece because I literally brought in a lot of works in my own from, from our collection. Ron Gorchak, Bill Jensen, Alan Graham, Ugo Ronginone, Chris Martin, Serena Saad, um, and my own work. And um, here's another view. Ben Keaton. Um, and the portraits on the right. I think there's another slide of them. So the portraits, these are one group of 20s. Now I think I have over 500 of them. So there's a lot over the years, you know, it accumulates. Um, so I don't know what to do with them. Uh, I don't know why this one is here. The, the, one, of the one of the most amazing painting at the, the Met, it's, uh, it's more than that, it's, it's measured 11 by 11 inches. And I did this show at the urging of two people, Francis, um, who runs the SVA gallery. You guys know that gallery on uh, 10th Avenue? And uh, it's just so compelling to think of when Pollock was asked, who's his favorite American painter, artist? Uh, he said, Albert Pinkham Ryder. He's the only painter he ever said he admired. And that occurred to me very interesting. Why would Pollock be interested in Albert Pinkham Ryder? I think he died in 1911. Uh, the very opposite of the grandeur of the, the Hudson River School, because they paint huge, you know, vista of Hudson River's view, the landscape there. And he belonged to that part, that movement, but he made tiny paintings. Not only he made tiny paintings, he also painted with unconventional medium. What you saw there uh, is made by candle grease and animal fat. So it's a deliberate to create that surface, what um, Clement Greenberg called the American Caraskuro. And I think Pollock also liked that aspect. As you remember, he also used unconventional material. House paint, enamel paint, industrial paint, on raw canvas, on all kinds of material. Uh, but ultimately, I think it has to do with the fact that Pollock was obsessed with Melville. Um, I, I, I know for a fact that his dog was called Ahab. And when he died, the book was left in the studio. And it's interesting because Ryder was born in New Bedford, Massachusetts, where in the first chapter, when Ishmael took to the sea, was New Bedford, Massachusetts. And there was a description in the ink, the Spouter ink, when he walked up to his bedroom. There was a description of that mysterious dark landscape, remember? It's exactly like Ryder, no more, no less. And I always love this painting because I have a friend who is a, a conservator. Every two years, they have to take the painting into, into the conservator room and put heat light because it would slide off after two years. So they had to lean back, put the light back, so it had to slide back. Otherwise, it would, over the years, slide off the canvas. And all the crack is marvelous, intentional, you know. So I always loved Ryder. 
Um, and many artist friends, people like um, Chris Martin, Ron Wachow, Bill Jensen, even Joe Bradley, um, everyone loved, loved and admired writers' um, paintings. So that's Pollock. I don't know. I think it had. I, I think it had to do with Pollock obsession with Melville as he was with uh, writer was with with Melville too. Uh, I think the idea of achieving a sense of intimacy. So it's an opposite of writer who painted in such a small scale, intimate scale. But you look at that haunting sense of vastness of the sea. It's psychological. Where, Paul, you know, people always felt or say to me and written a great deal about Paul of the grand scale, but I don't see that. I always feel, every time I encounter Pollock's painting, I feel the intimacy. Even, but he needs that big scale in order to express that intimacy. It's like the, that white line, that white light. It's when Ahab knew that he's going to be swallowed by the well. It's that moment where you know you're going to be at peace yourself and let yourself be swallowed. You know, the moment before dying. I always felt that about Pollock. So I did this show. I think I did this show at Mana Contemporary where I blow up a Pollock reproduction of Autumn Rhythm um, in the same scale as... Uh, as um, I don't know, I have it. Yep, the same scale, right next to each other. You can see the, the edge of the Pollock painting there. Just to provoke the idea of what is scale. You know, and I think it came from a great deal of, of my conversation over the years with Tom Nikoski. Tom Nikoski is a, you know, an amazing un, underappreciated painter until recently. I would say from 2008. You know, for the longest time he's been admired by many people, by myself, by Chris Morton, by David. David knows him. In fact, he's a neighbor upstate. Uh, and Tom, um, I think, had a hard time to making works that felt right to his own, um, I guess, growth in the early 70s. He was making big painting to keep up with what's going on. Until 73, he took a trip to, to Italy with his wife, the artist Joyce Robin, and they went to Siena, where they were um, exposed to Sienese painting. They are small predella, devotional painting. I think it was so important to him that he came back, decided to make two size painting. I think they began as 12 by 14 inches. And they grew over the years, like quarter of an inch, it's accumulate, and now it's uh, 24 by 32, I think. So it took a long time until Tom <laughs> managed to paint the painting that size. And when I ask him, what do you call that size, Tom? What kind of size is that? He say it's unreasonable, it's reasonable size painting. The painting in which you can still put under your arm's length, you know? And that was the show. It's called Reasonable Size Painting. So I featured Tom's five paintings in the show. Um, and here's another view of Bill Jensen. And then I did the show simultaneously. It's the opposite. It's called Unreasonable Size Painting, where people paint for no reason. You know, there's no reason why they paint a certain different size. They're not really, only one condition is not making the painting as sturdy for bigger painting. It has to be impulsive painting that be created without any kind of mediation whatsoever. So that was the opposite show which at SBA. I think it was open simultaneously at the same time. Uh, and you can see here the Pollock and the writer. Moonlight Marine is called. It's painted in 1908. And you can see that. This is early Alex Katz. 1953, 54, I think. It was a very important period for Alex. 
because it was a time that he had managed to create so-called one-shot painting. It means the whole painting had to be painted in one section. No going back, revision, no repainting, or accumulate more paint than that one section. So one is painted an hour, one painted two hours, one painted three hours, four hours. So it's very calculating the way Alex begin to experiment at this time. Um, so th these are very, I would say, um, primitive cats. And he was very comfortable with being primitive. Kathy Bradford, you guys know her work at all? She's just an old friend of mine who just turned 70. And now she's the, the most hip young painter out there, shown with Canada Gallery. Very happy for Kathy. And um, that's Ben Keen and his daughter checking out Ron Wachow's painting. Is that adorable? I think it, that may be the end. Yeah, it's the end. All right. Um, why don't we have a conversation? You know, I'd read about the Kunin. You know, I'd read about the Kunin being a house painter. Um, and I managed to meet the Kunin when I first came to New York. Um, very important because I think that wherever it takes you, required to do what you do, you just do it. You just do it, you pay the rent, but you have to take it seriously. The Kunin loved being a house painter. You say you, you, you were sheetrocking for I was very good. <laughs> At sheetrocking yeah. houses. Yeah. I was, they, I have a nickname, they call me Skimbo. Because I can skim the joint compound on the sheet rock so good that it requires no sanding. I love I'm doing impressed. it. Huh? I'm impressed. Well, I mean, you know, you have to do it, you do it. The Kunin loved being a house painter. You know, that's the thing. It's like, I don't know, I'm scared of American culture because it loves novelty. It loves youth energy. It devour, it chew you up, and it spit you out. I don't, that's one of the reasons why there's no mission statement in the rail. I don't know you know this. I don't want a mission statement. And it drives foundation crazy. Because they always ask me, who, who's, who reads the rail? Do you have a specific, like I said earlier, and what is it for? I don't want it. It, it simply say, the Brooklyn Rail reflects the artist's creative journey. That's it. You know, I just don't want it. The point is, I'm interested in slow growth. You have a whole lifetime to develop your growth. Why? Is, what's the hurry? Do you know what I mean? I don't think that's healthy for me. Not, not for anyone else's. But for me, I want to cultivate the slow growth. So the Kunin uh, was awesome because he did not have his first show until 1948. He's born in 1904. So that's relatively late, you know? And I know the full fact, the first show, the dark painting, the black painting, none were sold at the gallery. And when the gallery, you know, the show ended, my Shapiro called up, um, or Alfred Barr and said, you must come and have a sh look at this remarkable painter's work. And they bought one, you know. So they bought one, it's called painting in the Nama Museum. Same thing with Woman One. You know, that whole show at Sydney Janus, the remarkable show of 1953, none was sold again. He had to go back to do house painting, you know. And finally, Alfred Barr came and bought Woman One, the painting that Mai Shapiro insisted the Kunin would not destroy, because it was supposed to be destroyed, you know. So it's, uh, I think it's important to cultivate your, your growth slowly. And whatever you do, you know, in fact, I just interviewed Julian Schnabel. Um, he, he, he was a cook for a couple of years. He was a taxi driver like you know, David Rowe was a taxi driver for how many years, David? Ten years. Ten years, okay. 
he listened to a lot of weird conversations, I'm sure. Uh, you know, <laughs> a lot of time to think. You know, I love it. I love doing construction work, especially when I'm skimming. Because I'm thinking about other things. It's not just doing that, you know. So you can absorb, you, you can do a lot of things. And also, above all, a lot of artists was doing it. So you work with your peers, you know. So I met a lot of artists doing that. Um, I got to know uh, Bobby Newwood, who was Bob Dylan's manager. But he got hooked in heroin, so it looked, took a long time for him to clean up. He came back, and he and I was working for Bryce Martin. He was Bryce's friend. They went to art school together. Do you know what I mean? So it's really interesting. You meet a lot of interesting people in New York City, doing all kinds of things, you know? Um, so that's the question. I got good at it. It pays well, uh, well enough that I would take a commission and I would work for, let's say, three weeks and I would not work for two months, you know? But it killed my back, Forrest. <laughs> it killed me. <laughs> I mean, I have a bad back, terrible back, you know? So I think it's chronic now. Uh, oof. Um, but if I was a bigger person, I think I would be easily destroyed by it, you know. I went to give a talk um, in Miami, and um, no, it was at my wife's uh, opening, Natalie Povosti, and uh, a bunch of people came, and there was they asked me whether I would uh, come the next morning for a coffee meeting with the writers. And that's how the Miami Rail got created. I said, yeah, you can do it too. You know, as long as you don't copy the rail. It's very important they don't copy the rail. They have to create their own rail so that they are part of their community. Do you know what I mean? And the same thing happened with the third rail. I was there giving a talk like this. Um, and then before you know it, the guy sit right next to me like Forrest. Turned out to be Cameron Gaynor, an artist who I used to know in Williamsburg. And he's the one who um, became the publisher of the third rail. The third rail is very, very elegant. Have you ever seen it? Yes? Yeah. It looked the rail, make the rail look like shit, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I love it. And I love it. I think they, they should be, they're entitled to do what they want. They should feel free to do what they think is you know, the reflection of their own labor of love. Cameron Gaynor is exciting, I, it's terrific. So I, I think there's talk about the potential Houston Rail, and they are working it out at the moment, um, and LA people have been talking about it. Because, you know, it's tragic that artists have shows and nobody write about their work, they have no response. And that's partly why you guys are here. Uh, Study the craft to write. Thoughtfully, please. Always write thoughtfully and intelligently. Don't do the opposite. Don't do the opposite. And it's very important, as you know, artists, um, it build up an archive of their own literature. And when they die, the writing is very important. I've been in several committees where artists who would take liberty to act or behave a certain way, not so productive, not so friendly, um, and it makes it terrible consequences when they die because they stop showing or, you know, uh, for the longest time. And, and when they die, there's no... If the family is interested, they're lucky. If they're not interested, they're so unlucky. And there's an issue of maintaining the, the work. The archive, there's money involved, you know. Uh, but how do you validate the artist's worth? To us, people sensitive like ourselves, it's no problem. We can look at the work and we'll decide and we'll, we'll feel the work and we'll know it's good. Uh, but for most people, they don't have it. And that's why it's just huge responsibility to write about works of art that move you, you know. That's part of the legacy of the artist. I've been in so many committee where there's no writing of a certain show, a certain day. The show doesn't exist. 
you know what I mean? And it's, I don't think it's, it's, that's why the rail is the rail. Uh, I want to create more opportunity uh, for writers. Um, the artists and the writers should get together, should have constant rapport. So one of the thing is, uh, to make studio visit is very important. You guys have to start doing that at some point. I remember three, four years ago when I was still teaching here, and a, another seminar class that I taught at um, Charles Strauss program in photography and uh, video. Were you in my class then? Yeah, and the idea was to cross over. You know, you guys would go to visit those artist studio and would make, I mean, interview them. And that was really fun. Uh, so maybe that can happen again, I don't know. But uh, I hope that answered your question. You know, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. So the third rail is doing great. Um, they just uh, did a nice um, fundraising event that I was there. I went there recently for booming in, and um, I think we're gonna do okay. You know, just to keep the rail free. As long as it's free, that's all I care. It has to stay free. It has to stay free. <laughs>